Was that a two inch tape machine you guys were putting together out there? Half inch. Half inch. We're about ready to barbecue up some food. She was like, are you guys from the TV? <laughs> we're here at Dave Cooley's studio in Los Angeles. Uh, my name is Dave Cooley. I do all the mastering for the Light in the Attic Records. I think I got hold of Matt, the guy who's running the label, when I met him through uh, Egon, Ethan Alpat over at Stone Star Records, who I met in the basement of a record store with literally a light bulb hanging from the ceiling. So I guess it was a light in the basement, not light in the attic, but that's the same type of idea. Met Egon that way. We were going through 45s. We kept up over, you know, kept up over the internet, and then eventually we both moved to LA at the same time, him from Nashville and then me from Milwaukee, Wisconsin about 10 years ago, and I started doing all their mastering, and then uh, Matt, I think, got my name through Ethan at that point, and that's how I ended up doing all the work. I guess when I was a teenager, I was in a lot of bands, and then in my 20s, I was in bands, and then went into production, uh, and then ended up actually falling into mastering when I moved to LA because of meeting Ethan Alpad from Stone's Throw. Um, and so I ended up doing a shootout with their current mastering engineer, who was not very good at the time, and it was probably easy for me to, to beat them out, but you know, they liked my mastering better, and then they just told me the next day, okay, well, you're getting the entire catalog from now on, you're a mastering guy. So, you know, I just started doing that, and uh, it's, it's great, mastering is amazing, especially working with these old classics, you know, that, that these people, that these labels are putting out. It's just, it's awesome. Well, mastering an old record, I guess it's slightly different than mastering a record that's being done now, and that uh, sometimes, the, <laughs> oh yeah, um, mastering an old record is maybe a little bit different than mastering a new record in that, uh, well first of all, usually everything was cut to tape and so, and sometimes under less than ideal conditions, so sometimes they need a little bit more attention than stuff that's been even produced in a, in a bedroom now on a laptop, sometimes this stuff is a little more you know, clear sounding than the stuff that came out of the 60s. Not necessarily in a good way, the stuff in the 60s obviously had a vibe to it, and so you just have to kind of massage it to get it to sound like it's gonna work uh, in modern day context. So um, sometimes it's a little extra elbow grease, and then sometimes like the Serge Gainsbourg record, which Matt had me remaster, uh, History to Melanie Nelson, that thing came in like perfect. Like it just, the EQ is, so spot on, whatever Serge and his engineers were doing at Philips Studios in, in France in the early 70s was just, they, they knew what they were doing. It sounded, it sounded like almost like a modern record in the, in the level of like um, depth and, and frequency response to the record. It just sounded amazing, so from the get-go. Just depends record to record what it's gonna take. Well, in that case, uh, I didn't get the actual tapes to, to master from. Universal France did the transfer and uh, they're quite adept at doing that, and I think that it's just because, you know, the, the master tapes, they don't want them circulating around just because it's, you know. Pretty cool thing to have. Uh, the, yeah, the master tapes to the History of Melody Nelson by Serge Gainsbourg are, that's like the, that's like the Ark of the Covenant, you know. It's, <laughs> no one wants to let that out of the pyramid, you know. Yeah. Well, I'd have to say that the, let's see, my favorite records that I've worked on that, that Matt at Light the Attic has put out, I probably have to be the Serge Gainsbourg record, History of Melly Nelson, and also the Betty Davis records. I come from a background of collecting old soul and funk records and stuff like that, and just being able to hear the original tapes and then add whatever I could to it. It's an honor to work on those records, and you know, I was already a fan of those records before I worked on them, so it's like a treat to get the phone call, okay, hey, you want to work on this? It's like, yeah, of course I want to work on it, you know? You know, it's interesting, I think that uh, the way people record has changed a lot in the last couple of years. And um, one thing that people are very used to as far as mixing is concerned or production is concerned is that everything is very plastic. Not plastic meaning, you know, paper plate plastic or crappy. It's just that people are used to being able to change things constantly. So, you know, people want to be able to make the slightest, slightest change to something a week later, which I definitely entertain and I do my best to, to make sure that happens, but people are so used to the the undo button of their laptop or their computer that they expect that that can happen in a, in a large studio as well. So that I think that that introduces challenges for mixers, even, you know, 
even mastering engineers, people are used to revisions or trying to go back and like make subtle, subtle adjustments where, whereas historically people try to get the job the, done the best they can, shoot from the hip or, you know, and then, okay, we're signing off, it's done. And then, you know, we're off to the races. But now there's a little bit more, you know, revision type stuff going on, I think. Um, let's see, as far as mastering, you know, with the economy not doing well right now, it, it, I think that uh, budgets are lower, but you know, with mastering, there's always a need for someone who has an objective ear to put the final gloss on something, and maybe even now more than ever, because people don't have big budgets to do the mixing or to do the final production at home. So then, you know, at the mastering stage is really critical because you're kind of, you know, buttoning up things that maybe got lost in the shuffle as the record was being made. And so for me, the mastering business is just, I don't know, there's more and more of it all the time. And, and we're always trying to keep up with our, our backlog of stuff going on because it's, it's definitely in demand. Yeah. So I guess, you know, the one piece of advice I have for people that are recording at home, if they're sending their stuff off to be mastered, it's that uh, when, you're, when you're doing your final mixes, make sure that they're not overly loud, that the ones that you turn into the mastering engineer because a lot of people, you know, they're trying to get their volume to compete with what's out there on CDs, so they apply their own quasi-mastering on their finished mixes. And so, you know, what I'm looking to receive as a mastering engineer uh, from a project is something that, that still has a lot of headroom, still has a lot of dynamic range, hasn't been compressed, you know, to hell and back. And so I always tell people right away, make sure you give me a 24-bit file, which is the highest dynamic range, and then also make sure that you don't apply any limiting to that file or any clipping, which it's kind of shocking to me. Sometimes I'll get mixes that people want me to master, and they're they're actually clipping into the red off their computer or off you know whatever they're mixing with, and that just makes it really hard to you know uh, varnish the furniture before it's lacquered because these people are kind of giving me a, a finished, you know, the finished lacquered product with the volume and you don't want that. You want to be able to EQ and compress before you put that layer on and I, I don't, it kind of ties my hands if, if I don't have the right type of file before I start working. Um, that's that's one, my one guideline. Everything from there is just kind of, you know, I'm going to listen to what comes in and then try to do the best I can with it. Well, Dave, thanks a lot for, yeah. for sitting down with us. Cool, no problem. And for the hamburgers. Yes. <laughs> hamburgers. Please use a lot of uh, hamburger filler in that uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> flashing subliminal yeah. hamburgers in. Yeah. <laughs>